Evening, everybody, here and uh, elsewhere. Um, I was just going to really to uh, not to dwell on the excellent model. Some of you have heard far more than is necessary about the excellent model from me today, as I've been here since I think about half past eight this morning. Um, what I was going to do this afternoon or this evening was just to talk a little bit about what I think total quality management is. Uh, and look at perhaps a very simple six or seven step process that, that tries to bring all of those elements together. Um, we've, we've talked, as I say, we've, we've talked today about the excellence model with, uh, with some of the current students, but everyone knows there's all sorts of bits and pieces, there's ISO 9000, the scorecards, there's Lean Six Sigma. But to my mind, these are all parts of the same picture. They all fit together very easily and very simply. And all I'm going to offer you over the next half hour or so is, is my take on how those pieces can be fitted together within an organisation. Please feel free to contribute, please free, feel free to, to, to question, to challenge, to add some comments, to add some thoughts. Um, but otherwise I'll just drive blindly on through the slides. <laughs> okay, is that okay with people? Yeah. yeah. Where I can see it. Okay, so some quotes off Deming, the late, great uh, Deming. Um, a company is like an orchestra, not a bowling team. That makes sense to anyone? You're not competing against each other, despite the evidence in many, many organisations that I've dealt with. The organisations that work are the organisations who all play together, understand the same, the same scripts, sing from the same hymn sheet, to use the jargon. These are the organisations that succeed. Best efforts are not enough, we're being ruined by people doing their best. How about that one? What's that one? I'm doing my best. Oh, Come on, give me right. some time. You, know, you don't want people to just do that, they want people to, to, to give their all, I don't know. The most important figures for the management of any organisation are unknown and unknowable. on that. You know, there's an awful lot of stuff that you, you can't measure. I mean, take your own organisation, take the university. How do you judge, ultimately, how do you judge success? I mean, we're talking here about an alumni network. How will you judge how successful that, that, that network is? You, you'll never know the connections that people are able to make with each other, the benefits that might come from that. There's things you can measure and things you need to measure, but there's also a lot of stuff within management that, that you can't measure. You have to almost take on trust, but still be intelligent about. Where there is fear, you get the wrong numbers. I, I've worked there. <laughs> How's the project going? I used to work, work for an American company called Beck. We were project managers habitually lied to head office. How's the project? Oh, we're on time, we're on budget, until two weeks before the end of the project went suddenly with three million dollars overdrawn and six months late. You know, and everybody on the project knew about it, but nobody dared say, because the one thing head office wanted was timely budget mating projects. Anybody in the university lie about financial yeah. data? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, we're going to get 75 students this year. Uh, there's no true value of anything. I'm not quite sure what that one means. It was on the list, so I added it. Uh, it's very, it is, can be very difficult um, to get to get a real understanding of the value of what you're trying to deal with. There's a lot of stuff that that has an all the, the value is almost impossible to to, to quantify, almost possible to handle. Hand How do you put a value on a network? How do you put a value on the linkages, the, <coughs> the, the, the friendships that you make within an organisation, the way in which an organisation works, all the stuff that comes out of teams gelling together and, and working together in, in, in some sort of with some sort of common purpose. Anyway, there's just some some thoughts to uh, to, to share with you. Quality, total quality. Total, I mean, the course is called total quality management, isn't it? The, the total quality management has a history. It all started a long time ago with craft. The man did a job, taught it to his apprentice. The only quality that was necessary was, you know, 
did the master like the work that was done by the pupil? Things started to get more complicated. Quality control came in. Test and inspect. This is going back to the earliest days of 5750 and before that. The people realized that, that it wasn't that economic. It didn't make economic sense to throw things away once you'd finished making them. You may go through the whole manufacturing process, you test it, no good, right, scrappy. So people started talking about quality assurance. 5750 started to morph into 9001. And people started thinking more about controlling the process that controlled the product or service. Then that started moving more into quality management, which is sort of where most organizations currently are. Then we're not just thinking about quality, we're maybe thinking about health and safety, we're maybe thinking about operability, constructability, all of the other aspects of the, of, of the work. Then you start to move up towards top quality management, which is really deconstructing, the, to my mind, deconstructing the business. Because you're not just interested in trying to make the products, you're also interested in the people. Have the people got the right training? Have the people got the right opportunities? Have they got the right equipment? It's a lot wider, starting to get a lot wider than just looking at the product or the service and judging that whether or not it's compliant. It's going out and beyond 9001. We were talking a little bit earlier on today about the number of organizations that fail ever to look at 9004. They stop at 9001, they don't worry about the, the continual improvement aspect, the building on your strengths, examining your, your, your opportunities for improvement. And then eventually you start to get towards what the Rantry uh, Foundation started describing some years ago now as learning organizations, the organizations that are really engaged, really part of the community. It's not enough to just think, well, have, have our people got the right training? You start to look out and beyond that. Are the right resources available within the community? Are we getting engaged with the local high school or the local community college to make sure that the right sort of young people are coming through with the right sort of A-levels, the right sort of qualifications, the right sort of NVQs, so that we've got people to feed in at the bottom of the organisation? Is the whole organisation, the way it interacts with society, learning from itself, learning from the environment, learning from the organisation? And that, to me, is when you start to get towards total quality, so that an organisation <coughs> trite phrase, but every day in every way it just gets better and better. It has a structured improvement plan and it executes that, program, that uh, improvement plan in a consistent way that allows it to continually improve its services, continually involve it, improve its products, and continually strive to satisfy its customers uh, as much as it can. Because ultimately that's the answer. Isn't it? Ultimately any business, whatever the business, the third sector, private sector, public sector, ultimately it depends on making money, satisfying its customers and its client base, and, and, and giving as much job satisfaction as possible to the people that it involves and employs, and impacting them to, the, to a, a, as positive an extent as it can on the community within which it works. You can turn that a little bit further though as well, can't you? Because there's not just the community, but you're in the supply chain, mm. and so it's how your supplier supply to you. If we're serious about total quality management, without a good supply base, we can forget that one as well. And it, it, it goes it goes out into to the wider community, goes into central government, because you're wanting an education policy of the organisation. I'm not going to get into an argument about academies, but you want you, you want an attitude. <laughs> you want an, you know, a, a, an attitude within the country as a whole that supports commerce, supports uh, entrepreneurship, supports education so that business, whatever it might be, has the right raw material on which to work. And that, that at one level, that has to come from central government and local government policy. So it, it, it ends up, ultimately it ends up involving the entire country, or probably the globe these days, because you know, I work for a multinational, I'm sure there's other people in here who work for multinational, so you, you go out beyond national boundaries if you don't care. Does that make sense for people that are the history. More we're, we're, we're somewhere up in that TQM, hoping to try and get into that TQM box, edge up towards the learning organisation. So don't quote the name, we have a couple of quotes there. Not sure where I got the first one, but don't think it's a bit of a mouthful. I don't think it is. Total quality management is defined as an integrative philosophy of management for continuously improving the quality of products and services 
I think all that means is every day in every way we get better and better. It's, it's really looking holistically at the business, looking at the way it works, looking at the way it, it identifies the products and services that it needs to produce and goes about producing them. Because I have a background in the excellence model, of course I have to bring excellence in. I, I prefer the word excellence to call it the, the word quality, I'll be honest. Quality to my mind needs to be qualified. For the word to work, you have to insert before it top quality, best quality, poor quality, horrible quality, or whatever. Excellence can only mean one thing, excellence is excellence. So the pursuit of excellence, organizational excellence, product and service excellence, to my mind, makes more sense in terms of the language. But the excellence model, <coughs> 2013, which I've been talking to a number of people to at length today, that defines excellent organizations as those which achieve and sustain outstanding levels of performance that meet or exceed the expectations of all their share, their, their stakeholders. And I think that, that should be an aspiration for any organization, would, would people agree? That fundamentally what you're trying to do is make sure that you understand what your customers expect and want from you and do your damnedest to try and provide that. And sometimes have the courage, I suppose, to say to them, no, that's not something we do, you better get in that or someone else. There are times when you need to say no to customers. Excuse me, is that sounds like the learning organization? Yes. You hope so. <laughs> So, again, some thoughts that I've made over the years. Benefits, yes, I mean, this is what you would expect to get from total quality management. Uh, you'd expect to get some reduced costs, well, you'd expect to do more than some reduced costs. Uh, you expect to be ma able to match the expectations of your customers. You will have, or should have, or hope to have an engaged workforce. And a real sense within the organization that it's a shared journey that there isn't a management and work as well, that everybody is not in it together, but pulling in the same sort of direction, working as a team in a genuine way, not, not because someone thinks it's nice to do. And all of that will give you an, an advantage over your, your, your competitors. It's a very competitive world out there, change is endemic. If you don't strive to improve all the time, you will fall behind the competition. Would that be fair? So, how do, you know, how do I view TQM? Well, the first thing is to understand exactly where you are and how good you are at it. So to me, the first step has to be some sort of diagnostic, an analytic diagnostic, something that looks at every aspect of the business. And for me, something like the excellence model is the answer to that stage of the, of the issue. Because you can, look at the, you can look at an organization through the lens of the excellence model, and it really does, for me anyway, covers everything. The, the, the leadership style, the pursuit of strategy, management of resources, production of the right sort of uh, products and services. And it has the, the balance of results that, that I think will allow you to intelligently uh, determine how good you are or how poor you are uh, at it. And it's, as we were talking to, to earlier today, it's just a plan to check back cycle. But as I commented, you know, PDCA for many organisations, unfortunately, is a, a explain to, the, to, to some of the students earlier on, PDCA for many organizations means don't check, you know, please don't change anything. <laughs> and that's not the best way to keep your business healthy and keep your business competitive. You, you need to be constantly looking at how good you are and being honest with yourself about how good you are. And something <clears> like the excellence model, I think is that essential, for me, the essential first step. But all it does is produce you a huge shopping list of all the things that need to be improved and all the strengths that you've got. So the next thing you have to do, sorry, I'll go on that one instead. It's underpinned by the concepts of action, so I won't, I won't dwell on them uh, for the moment. You need to take all of those actions and turn them into some sort of an improvement plan. There's no point having a very powerful diagnostic tool if you don't do anything with the information that comes from it. So the next stage, is to turn it into a into an holistic again a plan. Look at all of the findings, sort and sift, talk, turn them into themes, prioritize those themes, and with any luck come out with one or two projects that will still so, Pareto thing, isn't it? The old 80-20 rule. Find the things that are really causing the business pain. 
in my experience, too many improvement plans start off by solving the problems that everyone knows about. And they're not always, or very rarely, the things that are really giving the organisation pain. Using a diagnostic, looking at all the problems, being intelligent, being holistic, being objective, allows you to construct a plan which is doable and will address the really crucial things first. Step one, the first step. It says, see what is the problem, isn't it? Yeah. The main thing with that is the, the, the mentality. Yes. If it's functioning, don't change. I know. Yeah. It's got to be, it's got to start. I suppose the first real step is a desire, a realization yeah, exactly. from the, the organization yeah. that it needs to do something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's why we tend to get involved as an organization like when somebody will contact us and say, we know we need to do better, be better, but we don't know where to start. But yes, that has to come first. Um, I know I need to lose weight, but until I actually go on a diet, it's not going to work, is it? Just standing on the scales every day and weighing yourself and hoping isn't going to help them at all. But too many of us do that. We just measure the business, measures itself every day. Oh, things aren't getting any better. Oh, well, we'll measure again tomorrow. So you have to take that step and say, right, we need to. We need to do that. And then you do the diagnostic. So really, yes, there is a precursor step. The main one is that they, they won't be changed. No. In the sense that you don't see what the problem is. It's a practical problem. As long as you're making profit, isn't it? I think it's a mentality for many organizations. I mean, again, to, you know, to use it, it's, a, it's the burning platform problem, isn't it? Right? Mm. How how serious does the fire need to get before you leap off the platform? An intelligent person <laughs> leaves long before the fire gets really serious, but you know, most of us wait until it's up around our waist. Or, um, but yes, it's, it's uh, it, but sometimes you know things happen in an organisation that, that you know, trigger hope, hopefully in time, but very often unfortunately too late. But complacency is a, is a tremendous uh, exactly. uh, tremendous threat to any business. Uh, we're lucky we work with organisations that, that are prepared to challenge themselves. So they've done that. Then you build the plan. And then, having identified the plan, there is a whole range of quality tools available to you to help to, so, solve that. And the important thing here at this stage, I think, is to use the right tool for the right problem. If you send your car in for a service in a garage, you know, you, you trust that the mechanic isn't going to use a hammer to adjust the tablets with or whatever they do with the cars, or no mechanic, I'm a civil engineer, you know, we only understand concrete and steel. But there are appropriate tools. Again, you know, we've encountered organisations that will just throw Lean Sigma at everything. No, don't do, you know, if it's a simple problem, set up a little improvement team, Give them some empower, genuine empowerment, just let them get on and improve it. You know, they don't need to go through hours and hours, days and days, weeks and weeks of deciding what the real problem is, collecting data, analysing, you know. If it's something obvious, you know, there's no date on the payroll form, where they just stick the date on, you know, and go back to business. So it, you need to improve, and there will be some things that do need something, a you know, more powerful tool like the Sigma. There will be some things that really need the business as a whole to, to take a strategic view of. But at least once you've got that shopping list of projects, you can identify what the appropriate tools are and put the appropriate mechanisms and controls and resources and so on in place to, to help you manage your, your program. Does that make sense to people? Just to, to briefly digress into Lean Sigma. Uh, or six Sigma, or whichever you, you know, whichever you want. It, to me, I mean, I never uh, was a black belt for a couple of years, but I never really got my head around the statistics. I couldn't cope with all of that side of stuff. But the the philosophy, the approach, the define, measure, analyze, uh, improve, control approach, that problem solving wheel, which can be used in many, many different sort of circumstances and in many different ways of emphasis is I think that what, what I would take from, from the Sigma process, the Six Sigma process, is that discipline of standing back and first of all making sure you really understand what it is you're trying to solve. 
I don't know about the rest of you, but you know, I'm an engineer. The first thing I want to do is rush off and, and, and solve the problem. And you can very often end up solving not quite the right thing that way. But I think there is certainly a British tendency. I mean, I mean, one, one organization we were working with, uh, and they decided part of the part way through the, you know, the sort of self-assessment process that we were facilitating, they said they needed a suggestion scheme. But one thing, you know, they weren't tapping into people's experience enough, they needed uh, something to, to help draw out all of the improvement suggestions. Within two minutes, there was a little group in one corner who were trying to decide how to make the slot on the wooden box that they were going to put in reception. You know, they'd forgotten about, well, you know, what sort of system do we need, what sort of process do we need? They were straight to, well, let's, let's, get, a nice, let's get a nice suggestion scheme box built and, and, and then, you know, rushing off to the answer too soon. Right in the back of it. You've got the internet, you've got other ways of collecting the information, you, you know, and so on. So we, we do have this tendency to rush off them. So I think the discipline, even if you're just doing a case end team or something of that sort, still need to keep that discipline of making sure you understand the problem, making sure you've got the data to hand, making sure you've gone through the full gamut of, of improvement suggestions and analyze them to see which ones are likely to work and which ones won't. And then imp most importantly, implement the whole thing. So that discipline is still using discipline. So the next stage is, so you now, you, you've identified what all the problems were, you've prioritized them, you've grouped them, you've got some themes, you've got some projects, you've got a plan, you're starting to, to work on it. For goodness sake, tell everybody what you're doing. Communicate successes, communicate what the point of it all is. Because the rumour mill will immediately start that the whole thing is a, is a cost-saving exercise. The whole thing is some way of getting rid of some part of the business or other. So the whole thing is just a way of cutting numbers. With most organisations, the truth is people don't even have enough time to do all the stuff they're supposed to be doing now. All you're going to do, hopefully, with an improvement plan is free up time so they can do more of the stuff that they should have been doing anyway. That's a, you know, you're not going to have to afford to sack anything. You're going to be doing so much more, making so much more project, profit, sorry, project uh, product, making so much more money, you'll still be able to afford to, to, to uh, employ everybody. So communicate, train people, make sure everybody understands, hopefully try and persuade everybody that it was their idea in the first place so that they, they commit to it and get behind it. And build proper plans for rolling the information out, making sure that people's behaviours are modified as appropriate and so on. And then build it into your management systems. Too many times, certainly in my own personal history when I was a quality system manager, too many times I saw managers changing processes and then hoping that some, some magic way the procedures would catch up later. Mm -hmm. Does that happen to anyone else's organisation? You know, no, if you want to communicate the change, communicate it in the first place by changing the procedure. You know, don't leave people confused as to, oh, we don't do it that way, we do it this way now. You know, that's, that's, just, that's just going to confuse everybody and lead to panic. So make sure that you understand exactly what's going to be changed, communicate it well, build it into your systems. I'm not talking about hugely onerous paper systems anymore. I mean, all of this integrated management stuff should be should be a lot a lot easier for people to manage these days uh, through the internet and, and, and electronic and so on. Um, we were talking a bit earlier, anybody come across uh, Annex, is it Annex SL, which is the new underpinning standard clauses for ISO 9000, 14000, 8000, to, to ensure a commonality, to ensure all the standards mesh together seamlessly so that things like management review and so on are all done uh, once and, and, and cover everything. It, all of, as all the current revisions are coming out, it will start with ISO 9015 now, uh, 2015. It will be underpinned by Annex SL. Is the same thing, the INS, the grid, the INS, yeah. the pass one? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. yeah. I mean, what I'm talking about here is, you, know, you don't want to, I would suggest anyway, you don't want the management system that have one lot of procedures for safety, one lot of procedures for environmental management, one lot of procedures for quality. You want to do the whole, you know, do the whole thing one time, and 
the whole purpose, the whole philosophy behind XSL is to ensure that, that happens as easily as possible. That all of these standards will, will have that commonality of, of approach, commonality of language. We try to do that in my organization because we are certified according to ISO 9001 and yeah. ISO 17025. And you'll, as the, as the current, as the new versions come in, 2015 versions come in 2016, so you'll have to get recertified. I've got the systems in those that were pretty well connected anyway. Were there flaws in them? Yeah, I mean, anyone with any intelligence has, has, you know, has, has tried to connect them in. I mean, they're just encouraging that connection. Yeah. So making, trying to make it, trying to make it more straightforward by having the, the you know, the, as a given, the common clauses. Yeah. Okay. Those not just in the food industry. We have like the MS and Tesco, and making sure that our systems were really fully integrated. So, is this an enhancement over that? I, I don't, I don't know enough about the detail of it. You'd need to, to take advice from, from someone who's better than fully better yeah, sure. I've yeah. only done, I've only done the, the very cursory briefing. CQI branch meeting. Okay. Okay. I shall go and read it. I've got all the stuff at home. Okay. I'm just not going to read it yet. It's a, a semi-retired person. I spent more time in the garden than reading <laughs> Richie Stadler, surprisingly enough. <laughs> but you need to somehow you need to have some sort of integrated management system to make sure that the stuff's documented and enshrined so that people have that certainty about how to work or what's expected of them. That used to move up on its own, but somehow I've managed to lose the, uh, the, the, the motion. But the whole point of, of the management system, you, you use the improvement process to roll you know, the stone, I suppose it's the stone of Sisyphus or whatever, up the hill, and then work in place with the management system to stop people backsliding. Because people will tend to go back to the old methods of working if you're not careful. I mean, we've, again, we've been in organisations where we've been facilitating change, and we've had to almost almost drag the old forms and the old manuals and stuff off the old, you know, the older generation of, of middle managers and, and burn them in front of them to stop them using them. Oh, I've had that, 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 that manual 50 years, give it me back. No, I'm sorry, you've got to use the computer now. It's tough. You know. uh, but things will roll back if you're not careful, if you don't control it properly. But it is, you know, plans you check out again. Little, little by little, step by step, you can get the stone to the top of the hill. Yeah, but then fortune is another hill. <laughs> Make sure you're keeping track of the progress and publicise the progress so that people develop the faith in, in the improvements that are being made. People will get want to get more involved with the process of improvement if they can see there are benefits to the business and to the individuals that are getting involved. Nobody, I mean, one of the students today was saying they'd been on an improvement team, gone through six months of effort, come up with a load of improvements, and then nothing had happened. Now, you don't volunteer twice for that sort of thing, do you? So it's important that you publicize success, that you quantify the improvement, make sure that you are getting the benefits out of all the effort. And something like a balanced scorecard, you know, is one way of, 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 of getting that. Anyone who can remember back to the slide of step one of the, you know, the, the diagnostic excellence model, you know, there is a, a great synergy between the standard type of, of, of scorecard and the four uh, elements of the uh, results, uh, or the four results elements of the, the excellence model. Okay. Not surprisingly, we would be worrying if they, if they were very dissimilar. But you can easily make a balanced scorecard that, that looks almost exactly like the, the four. Uh, elements of the, uh, of the uh, excellence model. Now that's what they tend to look like. Anybody use those? Something like it's a, just a way of, of dividing up your results and making sure that you're measuring the right sort of things. And the important thing is to make sure that you've got the right metrics in place. That you've got metrics in place that, 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 that feed against your strategy and underpin the initiatives that you're trying to execute so that you can, you can see how successful you Put all of that together, and you have sustainable continual improvement. It's, it's as easy as that. And that's all there is to it. The sort of thing we, this is going to, again, the slide I used that I earlier on. Um, all of this goes wrong, of course, in many organizations because 
for the most, most often, my experience most, most commonly, because there just isn't the consistent support from the top of the organization. Um, the person at the top gets distracted by some other fad, mm. um, can't wait six years, so because something like continuous improvement can take five or six years to, to really come to fruition. It's a long-term commitment for an organization, and sometimes some people are, are not prepared to wait. Stakeholders, shareholders particularly, won't wait five or six years to see the end of this. But it can become, if you're not careful, it become almost an end in itself. I've seen organisations that just get spend so much time and effort on the analysis, and the, you know they never get round to actually changing it and making anything better. It can be seen as, as a flavour of the month. All this, you know, like I said earlier on, in the conversation, the conversation I had with the company United Utilities recently, where they said, oh. We, we don't do uh, excellence anymore, we're doing lean now. You know, as if the two were, were interchangeable. And there's nothing, you know, if people don't see the benefits, if people don't see things getting better, then you, you, you look at the wrong things, doing the wrong things, wasting your time. Involve everybody. If you're constructing improvement teams, make sure that you have a real cross section of the organisation, particularly weighted towards the lower end. It's the people at the sharp end, the people doing the work. They know how the job's best done. By the time somebody's in middle management, senior management, they've forgotten, even if they came from the shop floor, they've forgotten the reality of it. And the guy at the top, they've probably never been on the shop floor before, uh, and just has vague ideas that were out of a book somewhere. I'm not denigrating every senior manager in the divisions, but you know, there is a disconnect sometimes between what head office think and what's actually happening in the, in the business as well. So you need to make sure you've got both the people who are empowered to change the process and the people who really understand how the process needs to be changed. You need to make sure both those people are in the mix so that teams can come up with things and also make the change. I don't think there's anything there I need, I need to dwell on. Um, it's all really about deconstructing the problem, breaking it down, it's the old, how do you eat an elephant, you know, slowly, slice by slice. But do not eat elephant. <laughs> I, I used a slide um, in one of my lectures, uh, we talk about implementation of systems, and that is one of my slides, I've got a picture of an elephant in a soup, soup bowl, and it is the same argument, how do you eat an elephant, and it's a bite at a time. So I think that was the reaction, because the, the further you talk about it. Well, you start with a very small elephant. <laughs> well, no, we're talking a big one. Yeah. But, but it's, you know, that can be a problem sometimes in an organisation. <coughs> they're almost overwhelmed by the, by the, 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 the perceived problems. And again, something like the exit spotting, pulling it into, it into a, a, an action plan. But, okay, well, there are 105 things that we need to do, but there's, let's start with this lot, because we can do this lot. We can do this lot this year. And we do this package, make sure you ring fence the project, make sure it doesn't start to fray at the edges, keep it tight, keep it compact, solve it, prove it's been successful, get everybody on your side, and then pick off the next one. And sometimes what happens is yeah. that the small problem that you solve has got implications for the rest of the problem, so it might just... Yes. Mm -hmm. So, so you don't effect yeah. that the rest of the problem is more... And you, oh, so you have to be careful when you're scoping the project exactly. that you that you do contain the scope yes. and, and stop the. There's always a tell. Well, we'll stop. Oh well, we might as well do that bit as well. Oh, and, and if we're doing that bit, we'll do that. And you, people start to pull stuff in even when they're not asked. Yes. So you need to contain the project. So, no, we're just solving this bit. Let's, let's start with something we can't you know, keep the control of. And to make very focused, just a couple of thoughts from this. Mm -hmm. I agree. I mean, one couple is particular needs to be owned at the top and cascade all the way down. I think otherwise it just doesn't, it just doesn't work. It, it's, it's part of a philosophy and a culture, I think, as opposed yeah. to just tools and techniques. I think it, it really needs to be weighted into the organisation. I think the other thought, I was picking up a bit on Jonathan's point earlier on, that um, over time business has become far more integrated with their supply chain. Yeah. The thing I'm much more alert to now um, is actually the, the rapid change that's going on in the nature of our customers and how they relate to us. And that's having very significant implications on, on how we as a firm operate and how our supply chain operates. And it's, 
in this sort of framework, how do we adjust to that? How do we how do we recognize that? that's that's a big change. I mean, for my I mean, I'm not long out of industry, but it's a big change from what I was experiencing. And I think I was in the whole food industry, so I have to say I think we were pretty smart in terms of having fully integrated supply chains and you know data would be moving quickly between us and the, and the supplier and the customers and, the, and back to the supply chain as well. So fully integrated, but it's a different sort of environment now. Yeah. With, with and it brings its own challenges. I mean, yeah. the other thing that's changed, I think, is there's, there's far more use these days of alliances. Of, 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 I mean, I worked for uh, two or three years with Network Rail in the West Coast mainline, and that was all alliances. It was, it was, they were made from, built from, particularly construction businesses who, who in other situations were, were as a, you know, almost competing with each other for, for work, but here they were trying to work together and coming up with harmonious processes, you know, that were able to do things, the, the, you know, the AMEC way and the network railway and the, all of the sectors could be very challenging and to get them engaged with improvement. I mean, we were, in the, in the end, we managed to get the West Coast Main Line accredited to ICI 9000, the biggest project that's ever been accredited. <coughs> it was a heck of a part. And then it was finished. <laughs> anyway, thanks for watching. Enjoy the rest of the evening and um, good luck with your assignments. I look forward to reading them. Okay, bye. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for watching. One of the things that we have to talk about is the talks. We need to talk. We need somebody to talk, a champion to talk. Yes. To talk. Yes. And ideally, you want the, the, the chief executive, whatever. I mean, certainly when we're doing assessments, all other things being equal, the first interview I, I will in, I must insist on, you know, is with the, the chief executive. Because if, if, if they haven't got time to see you, you're wasting your time doing the assessment because you're just going to hear the wrong stuff off people. You need to hear, first of all, you need to hear what the view from the top is, and then you. Then you go and start to talk to other people, find out what's really happening. But we're nearly there. Um, I think, uh, again, that's another sign of pitch from earlier on today. Most people have seen that. Uh, for, I'm finish with two quotes. Bernard Shaw, first one. The satisfied man adapts himself to the world. The dissatisfied one persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the dissatisfied man. I, I think that's fairly, fairly true. It's the people who make the fuss that, that end up actually having the most significant impact on stuff. People who just go along with it and, and keep quiet. And the other one, Dilbert, just to uh, love me. I, I love Dilbert, always have. Um, I love deadlines. I especially like the swooshing sound they make as they go flying by. You can make any idiot um, Agree to a deadline, but no idea can stick to it. That's it. Thank oh, you very thank much. You. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> these, are, these are from one of my colleagues. If we always do what we always did, then we'll always get what we always got. <laughs> uh, attitudes are infectious. Are yours worth catching? And finally, measure what in this is the key one to me. Measure what is, what is important. Don't make important what you can measure. Yeah. You know, sometimes it's very difficult to, to measure the right things, and the temptation is to measure something else. You've got to resist that. Thank you. Thank you.